Thank you so much for hitting the play button on another edition of A Duff Said. I'm your host, Duff Tyler, and this is episode 50 of this podcast. Thank you so much for listening from wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, so many people right now on Facebook are doing their 10-year challenge. This episode is going to be part two of my 20-plus year challenge. Last week, I shared the story from my college years of the night that I met legendary basketball coach Bob Knight. This week, I expand on that story. As many of you know, I attended Indiana State University. Now, most people often associate that school with legendary basketball player Larry Bird. What he did on the basketball court was a special time for my hometown of Terre Haute, Indiana. But after Larry Bird left, people stopped talking about Indiana State, and the program fell off the map. It wasn't until I arrived on campus in the mid-90s that things turned around, the Sycamores started winning again, and they went back to the NCAA tournament. They also developed a brief but intense rivalry with Indiana University. Now, these two schools are less than an hour apart from each other. Terre Haute and Bloomington are connected by Indiana State Road 46. It takes less than a few turns on that road to get from Terre Haute to Assembly Hall. But despite that, these two schools didn't play each other that much in basketball in the 20th century. Now, unlike some college rivals that see their other state opponents as little brother, ISU was more like IU's cousin that they maybe saw once every 10 to 20 years at a reunion. They just didn't play each other that much in basketball. Not until 1998. That's when the school that ISU coach Royce Waltman once referred to as the school down the road on 46 agreed to play the Sycamores in basketball. Now, I recently caught up with Indiana resident David Hooper to talk about those days. David was the sports editor at the Indiana State University School paper at that time, and he has a really interesting perspective on that time at Indiana State University. That conversation starts now. So Dave, a lot of people just heard about my personal experience on the night of November 14th, 1998. Obviously, had a little run in with the general, but I wanted to get your perspective on that night. What was your experience like on November 14th, 1998? Well, I was the sports editor of the Indiana States, which is a student paper in Indiana State. And uh, pretty neat to be, gosh, what was I, 21 years old and having a a sideline pass to Assembly Hall to watch... uh, Indiana State take on IU. Um, We had a former Bob Knight assistant, Royce Waltman, as our coach. Um, Hadn't played at IU in years. And uh, to to be a part of that, just just leading up to it, uh, was was incredible uh, to to go over there. I mean, it's it's no secret that Indiana State, you know, there's an inferiority complex that there was then and sometimes there is now. Everyone thinks IU's the big school and Indiana State's the mid-major. Um, and so to go over there and have that shot and in years since, as you know, Indiana State's beaten IU numerous times, but that was the, that was the first real start of it where they almost beat them. And yeah, uh, Sycamore's off to a first half, uh, 19 point lead. And then IU unsurprisingly comes storming back and ends up winning the game. Uh, Indiana State's uh, point guard, Michael Menser, uh, had a bad collision. I can't remember with who and broke his nose and, had this really disgusting uh, uh, scene. Uh, when you break your nose, it is just bloody, bloody the floor at Assembly Hall. Everyone remembers that. And you know, Indiana State did not win that game, but boy, did that trigger uh, years and years after that of many upsets. Uh, Indiana State beating IU numerous times, including just about three years ago, uh, they ruined Archie Miller's debut at IU and uh, beat him pretty handily. I'm glad you brought that up because even though we're reflecting on the past, I would love to talk about that for just one second because that night I had just experienced one of the coldest nights in my sports casting career. I got in the car and I looked at the score and I saw that ISU did not just beat Indiana. They put a beat down on Indiana at Assembly Hall. I think it was like 94 to 68 or something like that. 
and I just remember shrieking like a banshee. I was like, Wah! something along those lines. A couple of girls from a high school team that I was there to cover walked past the car, and they're like, what was that? And I was just <laughs> thinking, that is my excited noise when something miraculous happens, something I didn't expect to happen, but something I'm thrilled happened, and that is an Indiana State victory over IU. We got to enjoy so many moments like that, Dave. We were spoiled when we were students yes. at Indiana State because we got to experience a golden age at Indiana State University. I feel bad for all those people that were basketball fans or students at Indiana State University when they attended those games back in the days after Larry Bird left because a lot of people know Indiana State University went into a nosedive after Larry Bird left. People always associate Larry Bird with Indiana State University. He has his own statue, his number's retired, and he is a legend. And he's known primarily because of what he did for Indiana State. That was what put him on the map and made him one of the greatest college basketball players of all time. But after he left... People forgot about Indiana State because we lost for so many years. It was like 18 years in a row that the Sycamores registered a losing season. But in 1998, things changed. What exactly happened, Dave? Because I know you were a part of that, and I know that there were a lot of great moments that happened leading up to that night at Assembly Hall. But what had changed about the atmosphere as far as ISU basketball goes? Well, it starts with Royce Waltman, the coach. Uh, he had had success after he left Bob Knight's staff in the mid-80s uh, at the Division II, Division III levels at DePauw with an AW, the Division III school in Greencastle, Indiana, and then University of Indianapolis, a Division II program, taking them to the national finals. Um, so a heck of an X's and O's coach. Uh, he had uh, a leftover recruit from the previous coach, uh, Nate Green, who and Nate went on to play some European ball, and he's now actually an NBA referee. Uh, Angie, Angie, uh, Menser at the time, Angie Menser was a star track and field athlete and had a little brother who was Mr. Basketball in Indiana runner up to Luke Recker. So she was instrumental, I'm sure, in getting him to come to Indiana state. And at the very last minute, a player named Derek Stroud left the program, which left one scholarship open. And they found a kid named Matt Wren from Silver Creek down in Southern Indiana and gave him a scholarship. A um, couple other uh, recruits and transfers, and so they, they upgraded their talent through some of those very uh, uh, serendipitous uh, situations. Um, they had Greg Lansing, who went on to be the head coach for a while as well, recruiting. He, he was a heck of a recruiter. And again, there's just not too many X's and O's coaches back then that were much better than Royce Waltman. Um, they just played a different brand of basketball. I was there for the last year or two of Sherman Dillard and, and Sherman was a fine coach. And I think the Sycamores were a few games under 500 in one of his better seasons, but yes, it wasn't until from 1979 to 1997, zero winning seasons for Indiana state basketball, zero Roy Swaltman comes in year one winning record. And then as we all know, year two uh, beats IU or year three, and then 2000, 99 and 2000, uh, season's trips to the NCAA tournament. And I'm glad you brought up Sherm Dillard, too, because he was my neighbor. I knew him pretty well. He was always at the, the neighborhood functions, saw him, and we got to talk about basketball quite a bit. And I was kind of shocked that he left, but I was very curious to see who the new guy was going to be coming in to take over. And I'm sure the players that were going to be a part of the program were as well. And it didn't take long for them to gel very well as coach and players. I agree. And yeah, and that was, a, I'm glad you brought that up because that was another just uh, stars aligning situation. Sherman Dillard left because he played basketball with James Madison and their coach, and they'd either fired their coach or uh, their coach had left. And so it was a perfect opportunity for him to return to his alma mater and, and coach there. I don't think it went very well, uh, if I remember right after he left when he went there. Uh, but it just so happened that this, that Sherman Dillard was at James Madison alum i believe i believe it was james madison jmu and their their coaching opened up coaching spot opened up um i remember the introductory press conference when royce waltman walked in and and the athletic director at the time larry gallo sung his praises about his uh, his resume uh, his reputation uh, his character 
And one of the chuckles was Roy said with a straight face, in three to five years, we will be in the NCAA tournament and we will be competing for national championships. And some reporters chuckled. I'll never forget that. But as he called it, uh, three or four years later, uh, they're starting to win. They're in the NCAA tournament. They're upsetting uh, Oklahoma. They're hanging with Gonzaga, almost making the Sweet 16, literally competing for an NCAA championship. So Roy Swaltman called a shot. I have a favorite Royce Waltman quote that I would like to share, too, because, like you said, he was in Greencastle over uh, about uh, 40 miles away in Putnam County. Indiana State University is two counties over in Vigo County. So he got to go over to Holman Center quite a bit. And I remember somebody asking him in a press conference, you know, what was it about Indiana State that really interested you in wanting to come here? And he just said, you know, I was just coming over sometimes, watching the program and seeing what these guys were doing, and I thought to myself, these guys are working really hard to screw this thing up. I wonder what I could do to make a difference here. Well, that was Royce, very blunt to a fault. <laughs> that was Royce. Um, he always had one-liners, always um, always had, uh, had a joke in the pocket. Now, he could be very intense, and I think and uh, I went to his funeral. I love the guy. But, and I don't think anyone would dispute no, uh, the fact that he had a temper, got a few technicals in his day, got into it with the refs, got into it with the media every once in a while. But overall, a good guy, a funny guy, and a hell of a basketball coach. He and I had a good relationship. We, we always got along great because I worked with him on the coaches' shows, and we were always interviewing. He always had me in his office. He always made time for me. I, I always appreciated that about Royce. And I went to his funeral and Nate Green, who I mentioned earlier, who uh, is now in the NBA as an official, actually, told a story. Uh, they and this goes back to IU uh, the year after 98, the 1999 Indiana State victory over IU uh, that caused them to defi- to cancel the future uh, many tournaments. Uh, the Indiana Classic or the Hoosier Classic. I can't remember which one they called Indiana it. Indiana Classic. Never lost. Yeah. And so they win the game. The team's on the bus in Bloomington. Gary, go back to Terre Haute. And Royce, who was in his early 60s at the time, gets on the bus with his wife, Carol, and he says, fellas, I'm not going back with y'all to Terre Haute tonight because after a win like that, even an old guy like me might get lucky. <laughs> <laughs> that is so Royce. That is so Royce. Gosh. And the way Nate told it, the funeral just brought the house down. It was, it was a great moment. Oh my gosh, what I would have given to have been there. And you know, Royce was such a a great, compassionate individual too. He always made time for me when there was no microphone in my hand, there was no camera around. I ran into him once getting a cup of coffee, and this is after I had just gotten the job at the Tribune Star. I was a part-time sports reporter. It was my first job out of college. I was really excited. I ran into Royce at that coffee shop that was in the Commons at Indiana State University, You probably remember that pretty well. That was near our old office. Yep. And so I bumped into him and I said, hey, Royce, how's it going? He said, oh, not too bad. Just hanging out. What's new with you? And I told him about how I got the job at the Trip Star. And he said, you know, that's going to be a great opportunity for you. This is going to be a chance for you to grow. That's awesome. Good for you. I don't think there's a single coach out there that would have said that to me at that time. And he knew I was a college kid that was about to embark upon the world So for him to have actually taken the time to ask me how I was doing, what I was up to, and to offer me some words of encouragement, you just don't really see a Nick Saban or, in this instance, a Bob Knight probably doing that for a guy who goes into the media. Well, no, Bob Knight ended up getting fired because of how he treated a student, remember? Oh, yeah, we'll get to that in a minute for sure. Let's talk now about November 14th, 1998, because this was announced as a three-game series between the Sycamores and the Hoosiers, that was a huge deal at the time because, like you said, Indiana State was the little guy. We didn't really play Indiana that much because IU was a powerhouse. They were somewhat of a dynasty. They had three national championships, so they were always looking for the big-name opponents. But, like you said, because Royce used to work with Bob Knight, they worked out a friendly gentleman's deal, a three-game series. First game would be the first game of the season in 1998 at Assembly Hall. So we get there. The place is packed. The atmosphere is probably unlike anything that some of the guys on the Indiana State team had ever experienced before. And I just remember walking in thinking, these guys are going to remember this. But 
I'm not anticipating really this a Sycamore win tonight. I knew they had a winning season because we were all a part of that the year before, but I wasn't really expecting them to really do anything against the 22nd ranked team in the country going into that game. But then, like you said, it happened. 45-26 at halftime, Indiana State flexed big time on the Hoosiers on their home floor. And as I'm walking back to the press room with that score at halftime, I'm thinking, okay, by no means is this game over. They're probably going to make a run in the second half. Just stay calm. I was so excited because I did not see that coming at all. I ran into some old classmates of mine from high school that went to IU and they, they were looking at me like, dude, it's good to see you, but man, your team is killing us. I really felt like at that moment, this program had arrived. Yeah, yeah, and Royce told a story that uh, walking into the halftime, he uh, he said to himself, well, I had a speech prepared if we were down 19 at the half. I had a speech prepared if we were down one at the half, and I had a speech prepared if we were up one at the half. I had nothing prepared if we were up 19 at the half. Yeah, that's uh, I perfect. Remember, yeah, and uh, no, I just, that first half was something else. I remember Kirk Haston miss, missing a lot of bunnies for the Hoosiers. Uh, Nate Green was making everything. Menser went out early. I don't know with that injury. I don't know if that uh, inspired everyone uh, to a certain degree. Um, But and God only knows what Bob Knight said to the Hoosiers at halftime. I'm sure it had plenty of uh, four letter words and, and, um, you know, and look, Knight is Knight. He's a master motivator. He, he, He kicked them into gear, no doubt, at halftime, made the necessary adjustments and man, IU came out in that second half with uh, just a level of intense, well, the level of intensity you expect from a top 25 program. Um, so it, it was, I, had, I remember sitting at press row, kind of working on the story and the column, just what was I going to say about all this? And I remember doing a lot of editing and deleting because, you know, we were up big and then it started, they start to chip away, start to chip away. And yeah, by the last five minutes, I think IU had pretty much fully come back and taken the lead. It almost felt foregone at that point. Um, but boy, that, that that night, you're right, Duff, that night started what I'll call kind of a mini renaissance for Indiana State basketball that lasted a good four to five years. That, that was the night. I agree with you. That was probably the night that you can say Indiana State basketball is back. There's a renaissance. There's a new sheriff in town. And what a run it was from, from 97 to 01. With guys like Matt Wren and Michael Menzer, you knew that they were playing for something because, like you said, these were talented players. And like a lot of kids growing up in the state of Indiana, you know they had dreams of playing at Assembly Hall and playing for Indiana University. And it just didn't work out for them. It didn't play out that way. So you had to figure in the back of your mind, those guys really wanted to shine in that moment. And did they ever? Yeah, it's a shame Menser went down with that broken nose. Who knows what would have happened. Um, I maintain to this day that if he didn't go down, I think we would have swept that series. Yeah, I, I, I don't see why not. I don't see why not. And, boy, he sure made up for it. Uh, as your listeners may remember, if they did go to ISU two years later, there was the Menser miracle at the Holman Center where he made up for it and hit a bu- hit a almost ba- basically a buzzer beater one second left on the clock uh, to beat the Hoosiers in Terre Haute, which is a, which is another great story. And yeah, I'm sure, uh, especially like you said, guys like Matt Wren um, and other Indiana all-stars, uh, most of them have that same story. You're right. The dreaming of playing for the Hoosiers, playing for Bob Knight. Um, and boy, they, they did. They sure did take that opportunity to shine then and in years to come. Yeah, the headline that night in the Terre Haute Tribune Star was half an upset because essentially that's what it was. They led at halftime, but they couldn't put it all together for an upset victory. Indiana won that game 76-70. to As the game ends, there's a lot of handshakes at midcourt, including one between Royce and Bob Knight. They shared a handshake. They shared a moment after the game. All you wanted to know, Dave, was just what was being said between the two of them. So in the press conference after the game, Knight is there and he's talking about the game. You had one of the first questions. I get so much flack because of what Bob Knight said to me, but he actually lit into you first. He actually looked at you when you said, what did you say to Royce Waltman after the game? He looks at you and says, 
Well, if I wanted you to know, I would have gone to the loudspeaker and spoken to him. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. You just recounted that story exactly the way it went down. Um, look, I, I just, I had had, uh, I just thought it was really neat uh, that we had a, a coach from the that was on the staff of the of the IU national championship team eighty seven, um, and like any other Indiana kid, you're kind of uh, you're just Bob Knight's just quite the character to be interested in on a whole host of levels. Brilliant, funny, profane, intense, just just a just an enigma. And I just always had this interest in the relationship between Royce and, and Bob, Bobby, and um, and Royce's time there, and what he learned from Bob, and and, and it was something that was just in my head. And, and the fact that they had brought Royce um, in, a former IU guy, it was just something I wanted to know. I wanted to know more about the relationship. Um, and here's what Bob Knight said about Royce Waltman. Uh, whenever I just pulled this up as you and I were talking, they did a retrospective when Royce passed away. And the athletic director at the time, Larry Gallo, called Bobby Knight saying I was thinking about hiring Royce Waltman. Knight says, quote, Waltman, your recruits, he, they won't be as tall, fast or high leaping as those that go to a Big Ten school like IU. But he'll get those guys a little bit below just a notch. Then those will get, and they'll come in here and beat us. Bob Knight predicted Royce could come in and beat him, and he almost did that night, and uh, he did obviously the next year. Um, so yeah, he laid into me, and that's that's fine. That's that's Bob Knight. It's not nothing I wasn't expecting, uh, but I just I really wanted to get into get into it with Coach Knight about his relationship with Royce, but obviously Coach was having none of it. <laughs> Well, and you know, you asked him a legitimate question. Yours was actually one that was worth answering. Mine was just, I wasn't paying really close attention to what he said. I was just determined to speak to the general because that's who he was. That's Bob Knight. He was larger than life for anybody that lived in the state of Indiana during that time. He was a legend. And I grew up watching the Hoosiers on TV like so many other people did. I knew about him. And I, as a journalist, I just had a moment where I saw somebody that I'd grown up watching. Sometimes they say you never want to meet your heroes because it could backfire, and it certainly did on with me that night. What the hell have I said since I've been in here? I mean, do, do you understand English? You know what, we can look back on it and laugh at it now because we're in a long line of journalists that have asked Bob Knight questions and kind of gotten responses like that. But unlike you, I wasn't fortunate enough to make The Sporting News. A few weeks after that game, I pick up my copy of The Sporting News, and there's an article in there about Knight and the Hoosiers. So as I'm reading through it, at the bottom of the page, there's a section that has that exact quote that he gave to you that night. Yeah, that was the neat part about uh, doing what you and I did as students. Um, sometimes uh, the Tribute Star would, or the Associated Press would give me a little extra money to just write a two paragraph blurb about the game. And because it's a division one game, it might end up in the Chicago Tribune, the LA times USA today. Uh, at the same time we're talking about all this stuff. You'll recall Larry bird was brought in as Pacers coach. And I got to go to that press conference. And I actually asked the very first question in the whole press conference of Larry bird. And the quote that he gave ended up going into their media guide. So you do get those neat opportunities. Um, and I had a few, uh, both with coach Knight and Larry bird and Royce Waltman. Um, just cause yeah, that, Indiana state was starting to get back on the map. And when Larry comes to town or Bob Knight comes to town, it, it, it makes the news. What a great time it was to be a part of Indiana basketball during those years. Such oh, great yes. memories. We're and lucky. speaking of great memories, the following year, you kind of alluded to this. There was a tournament called the Indiana classic. It took place every year at assembly hall it was just a tournament of IU and basically three other mid-major schools that were brought in to be part of this. It was a two-night ordeal, and it just so happened, all the stars aligned, that Indiana and Indiana State met in a rematch from the game before. And this time, Indiana State got the W. Lewis will bring it in. Here's Jimenez. He's got a three. It's off. Oh! And Indiana State has won the game 63-60. to 60. There you see the Indiana State team, Royce Weltman and Bob Knight, meet to shake hands. There's Royce 
on uh, a big win for Indiana State. That snapped a 50-game winning streak for IU in their own tournament. No other team had registered a win against IU in that tournament. No other team got to hoist the Indiana Classic Championship trophy other than the Hoosiers. And so Indiana State walks off with that trophy. But when that game ends, I was doing the same thing I was doing the year before. I had my old VHS camera from the campus TV show, Sycamore Beat. And I just took off running up the floor. And I'm showing the excitement of all the players because it ended on a missed three by IU. And that sealed the win for the Sycamores. So naturally, everybody on the team is elated, excited. I saw Michael Menzer coming my way, and I just said, that a boy, Mikey. He leaps in the air. He could have dunked this night. Michael Menzer's only 5'11", but this leap got some hang time, and he just reaches out, and we high-five in midair on the court, and I'm still trying to hold my camera. And then the next day, I watch it on TV. That was on SportsCenter. That was on CNN. That was on all the Indianapolis stations because it was the WTTV 4 feed that always carried the IU games on television. So I got to see myself on national TV. Were you at that game? I was there as a fan. I was there as a fan. I was getting ready to graduate. Um, I think, or maybe I'd already graduated or was about to, because that was obviously pre-conference season. So it would have been November, December-ish. Um, and I was there as a fan. I remember, yes, Luke Jimenez shooting that three in the corner and it missing. Um, and, uh, I remember being an obnoxious fan <laughs> because, uh, we had, I think we'd led a lot of that game too. Um, it, it wasn't like a comeback. I think we'd hung and been in the lead or at least kept it close most of the entire game. And, um, yeah, again, being that mid-major, smaller school, going up against IU and beating them. And, yeah, I kind of had in my brain how, how the general talked to me that year before, and that was so sweet. Man, that was so sweet. And here's what Michael Menzer had to say about it afterwards. This and being in the All-Stars, uh, basically the highlights of my career right now. It's just a great win for the individuals in our team and our team as a whole and, our, and the city of Terre Haute. Um, we want to thank the, the fans that made it down here and made a little noise for us. Uh, and uh, it's just a big win. Um, we struggled down the stretch, but somehow we, we pulled out the victory. Bob Knight went into the Sycamore locker room right after that game and said, guys, great win tonight. Don't let it be your season. Coach was just uh, congratulating, congratulating us on a big win. And he basically said the same positive stuff that I just said. It was a great honor to have him come talk to us. I mean, he's a legend. And um, for him to walk in the room and give us compliments is, is unbelievable. I remember at that moment, I just thought, we are going to go to the NCAA tournament now. There's no doubt in my mind that this school is going to make the big dance. They were one of the last teams to get into the NCAA tournament that year because they had some bumps along the way in the Missouri Valley Conference. They were there on the last night of the regular season. I was calling this game on radio. They won the Missouri Valley Conference regular season championship. 51-46, Rob Dye the ball. Swings over to Rob, and he loves the ball. Two block. It's on fast break. It's Duck Dye, baby. Yes! A double arc by Keelan Block. And the Sycamore take a 53-46 lead. Timeout Bradley. Ben Anderson. It's his final game of the home center. He's out and hugging everybody. Keelan blocked the basketball. Nine to shoot. Block. He's got to hurry. He's got six. He's going to dribble in. Take a long two. In it. Good. He got it. Unbelievable. The ice man. Keelan Block knocks one down. It's 56-52. Three and a half seconds remain from an NBC championship. And you look, everybody's got a three-point stance. They're ready to charge the court. Here it is. Die a three. No good. No good. Here come the third. It's an NBC championship. The Sycamore's win. I have two wins. Victory number 21. This place has erupted. Unreal. What a ball game. There is a mob on the court. Alumni are charging the court. I can't even tell where the players are. And guess who was there that night in attendance? Two. None other than Larry Bird. Oh, that's right. That's right. He was. Yes. 
Yep. Yes. Larry didn't come back to many Sycamore games, but supposedly the story goes when he was with the Pacers and the Sycamores beat IU back on December 5th, 1999, one of the players for the Pacers, I can't remember who it was, actually went up to Bird and said, hey, Indiana State beat IU tonight. And Larry just said, yeah, I know. I was watching. Yep. And then, sure enough, on the last game of the regular season, he comes walking out on the floor at Indiana State at Holman Center. I had not heard the crowd at Holman Center for an Indiana State game that loud before, but everybody was pumped at that moment. And I just remember looking at my broadcast partner and saying, we're going to win this one. We're going to beat Bradley tonight. What a night yeah. that was. Oh, and I want your listeners to know I have it firsthand and secondhand from a lot of coaches and Indiana State people. And the times I interviewed Larry myself, he has followed ISU from the, from since 1979. He follows it. He knows it. He may not come to all the games. Uh, he may not be out there, you know, wearing Sycamore blue and, and cheering things on publicly, but he follows Indiana State basketball very closely. So your story about him already knowing the upset does not surprise me. Larry Bird still follows ISU basketball very closely to this day. Coming up, a big change is made at Indiana University, and Michael Menzer knocks down a shot for the ages. Winter is here in the state of Michigan, but hard cider is good for all four seasons. Looking for the best hard cider in Oakland County? Then stop by Fourth Coast Cider Works. Located in the main entrance to Canterbury Village, Fourth Coast has many flavors on tap and some you can take home. Now if you're like me and you like testing your useless trivia knowledge against others, then come on down to Fourth Coast on Thursday evenings for Trivia Night. Fourth Coast is open Thursday through Sunday. For a complete list of ciders and hours, go to fourthcoastciderworks.com. Fourth Coast Cider Works. Quality craftsmanship, quality hard cider. And that's a tough said. Once again, I want to say thank you so much for hitting the play button on this podcast. And that includes two very special listeners, Michelle and Bethany. They recently became patrons of a Duff set. Now for as little as $2 a month or $24 a year, you can help this show to continue to grow and provide the content that you enjoy. And if you become a patron of a Duff said, we have got a lot of great gifts in store for you. We've got bumper stickers. We've got t-shirts. Heck, I'll even record your voicemail message. So if you're having trouble ever figuring out what to say, I'll say it for you. And that's a Duff said. If you'd like to become a patron of A Duff Said, all you got to do is go to patron.podbean.com backslash A Duff Said. It is time now for a classic rewind. If you're part of my Michigan audience, you'll appreciate these fun facts. Now, Indiana State did not win against IU back on November 14, 1998. But two nights later, they did the next best thing. They beat Western Michigan. Now, as a lot of you know, a Duff set is a big Central Michigan house. Fire up chips. Now, when Indiana State made it back to the NCAA tournament in 2000, it was their first appearance since 1979. Now, we all know that game was famous because it was the first time we got to see Larry Bird go up against Magic Johnson. And as we also know, MSU won the title game over the Sycamores. The Spartans won the championship again in 2000, and guess who gave them a little a Duff said karma? Right now, this is a new tune from Guano Apes. It's Lords of the Boards. Seen quite a few of those in the NCAA tournament. It's The Rock, 107.5 ZZQ. You're on your way to Indy to hopefully see uh, Michigan State, who is still keeping me alive in the old office pool uh, Linda Jones is in next, and uh, I understand uh, that thanks to Florida beating Duke, she's out of it like so many other people who uh, went with the Devils to win the championship. 
Myself, I said it in preseason, I like the Spartans, and I even put down two brackets in the pool that the Spartans would claim victory, and uh, all they got to do is beat Iowa State and uh, march on to Indy and claim the prize, and then I get some lots and lots of cash. Hey, you know what, Duff? What's Nobody that? cares how well you're doing, okay? Because we're all in the toilet. Just flush us, okay? But nobody cares, all right? So quit! Oh, yeah? Quit roaming it in. Who, who knew? Who knew that this this year's tourney was going to be so upside down? It's just weird, man. I picked a lot, couple of those okay, upsets. All right. You know what? We don't care. Just play the song. Okay. Well, that's because I'm good. <laughs> it's like I always say, if Duff said it, it must be true. And in 2000, it was. You're welcome, Sparty. And now, my conversation with David Hooper continues. One of the things that was unique about that win over Indiana in 1999, we didn't know it at the time, but that was going to be Bob Knight's last season at Indiana University. Of course, we all know the stories that followed after that season. They lost in the first round to Pepperdine in the NCAA tournament. And then the stories about him and Neil Reed came out where supposedly he put his hands on him, he choked him, and people didn't know what to make of that story. And then the video came out, and we saw that, yes, he did, in fact, do that. I grabbed a lot of kids. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Did, did society change during the course of time? Because we've talked about... No, I think people changed there. There are enough people changed there that were tired of basketball of being the guiding light of the university. And I won't go in any other direction. He was placed on what they called zero-tolerance policy by Miles Brand, the president of Indiana University. At that point, one more slip up, one more outburst, and he was gone. You might as well have called it double secret probation like at Animal House. Double secret probation. Double secret probation, sir? He was basically on his last strike. And then out of nowhere, the most obscure, random thing happens. Some kid came up to me and say. Hey, Knight, what's going on? That kid made a dumb mistake. You know, I went over to that kid, and I did a lot more for the son of a than his parents ever did for him. And I went over there, and I said, son, let me tell you something. You don't address adults like that under any circumstances. And that's why I have no use for Indiana University, because they use that as a reason to get me out of there and that's absolute i'm still trying to wrap my head around that's what it took for indiana to pull the trigger and fire bob knight because in that time dave as i'm sure you're well aware indiana was still a top 25 program but it kind of fell back a a few steps during that era after they made the sweet 16 in 1994 it was a different team They were routinely getting bounced in the first or second round of the NCAA tournament, and they weren't really a contender for a national championship. They were still meeting the 20-win plateau, but that was about it, really. And there were people that were wondering if it was time for a change, but I don't think that anyone saw the change coming that way. I'm uh, I'm friendly with one of Bob Knight's lawyers, and uh, the story goes uh, that numerous people in, in Coach Knight's inner circle so when that um, zero tolerance policy came down, said, coach, just you got to quit. You got to get out of there. It sounded like there was obviously a lot going on, as you mentioned, even before that, besides the lack of success uh, leading up to the incident. But, uh, yes, there, and night oh, night, I think, said that at certain interviews that some of his inner circle, whenever that zero tolerance came down, he should have got out of there. Then he probably stayed too long. And um i just remember getting the news and my first thought was well this stinks because indiana is scheduled to come into the holman center and i was looking forward to the general actually coming to Terre Haute and having to play in front of that crowd and it ended up being mike davis but it also ended up being a very very memorable game it was an amazing game i was on radio for that game and i'm going to play the clip right now final seconds of the game IU is ahead by two points, and the ball is in Michael Minzer's hands. Here we go. Minzer the basketball. Four, three, two. Minzer for three. Can he hit it? He got it! He got it! He got it! 
He got it! Michael Mitzer! He's put the big horse up by one! I don't believe it! Five tenths of a second remaining. I don't I believe it! Mitzer knocks it down! This place has erupted! Michael Mitzer hit another desperation three! That was the loudest eruption that it, I think it probably had taken place at Holman Center since Larry Bird played there. It was a sold-out crowd. Every seat in Holman Center was occupied that night. You had IU fans that made the trek over and Terre Haute IU fans that were there. But there was a huge Indiana State crowd for once, and it was so good to see that. I wish I'd have shut up for a second and just let the, the sound of the crowd take over. But what a moment and what a game by Michael Menzer to win that game 59-58. to Huge three-pointer. It was one of two that he made in less than 13 seconds to essentially beat the Hoosiers. We're seeing somebody really special in Michael Menzer. What is his legacy with Indiana State? He had a, uh, at that point, he was leading the nation in assist-to-turnover ratio. Um, he had a green light to shoot from wherever, whenever he wanted to. Um and then, yes, that was known as Menser's Miracle, uh, hitting those threes uh, to end the game. One quick caveat that people do forget, there was a one, there was one second left on the clock, and IU did inbound to Jared Jeffries, who he did from half court, and it almost went in. To paraphrase Jim Nance, it almost went in, mm-hmm. uh, but, it, but it didn't. Um, yeah, I mean, he's a Sycamore great. Uh, he was the diamond in the rough recruit. Again, he was set runner-up Mr. Basketball behind, uh, behind Luke Recker. And I don't think he was recruited Duff by if you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, was he even recruited by any other Division One schools, uh, or at least scholarship wise. I don't know if he got any offers from any other Division One schools. Um, but as much for his shooting, I just he never turned the ball over. Just having a point guard that can handle the ball the way that he did, um, that was just as huge as his shooting ability, if you ask me. Um, but yeah, he goes down obviously as one of the greats. One of many great moments that Royce Waltman enjoyed as head coach of the Sycamores. But after that group graduates, Michael Minzer goes on, uh, Matt Wren moves on, Nate Green moves on. After all that talent leaves, Royce Waltman was never really able to duplicate what he did with that group. There was never really that magic that we had with that group. And he ended up having several losing seasons following that. And eventually the school let him go. But... I don't think you can look at those losing seasons without remembering what all he accomplished in bringing that school back from the depths of despair. Yeah, you're exactly right. And uh, yeah, he had had some health problems. Uh, I'll, I'll always say Greg Lansing's the second best thing to happen during that time. He recruited all those kids, took over for a while. And Greg Lansing, if you remember, did have a stint at Iowa under Steve Alford. So he did not have Lansing recruiting for him. So recruiting went down. And Royce even said that on the record that they made recruiting mistakes. Uh, one quote that gets national attention a lot, when Royce was let go and he lost his last game at the conference tournament, He said, I'm not the least bit bitter, but he said, you know, in this coaching business, young coaches need to keep this in mind. Get fired for anything other than losing, and you can get another job. You can cheat. You could not graduate players, but that darn losing. And I've heard Dan Dockage uh, use that quote a lot on his show. Uh, He used it with uh, Dan Patrick. He used it on Dan Patrick's show, talking about Royce Waltman on national TV. Um, and Royce's other quote, he said, because it had leaked the fact he was getting fired from a board of trustees meeting. I'm not one bit, bit bitter, but the administration handled this with a deft touch of a 20 mule team. Um, they, uh, they, they set it at a board of trustees meeting, which is obviously going to leak out, but yet said they didn't want it announced away after the tournament so it just left us with every man woman and child in Terre Haute knowing I'm fired I remember that <laughs> quote that was a, that was so on point for Royce Waltman perfect quote great way to describe that because I think we all knew that his contract was going to about to expire and they weren't going to bring him back and he did so much for that program and he's right no one can overlook losing but they can overlook so many things. And it's interesting the timing of that quote because while he was talking about that, I believe Kelvin Sampson, who later took over at Indiana, was under investigation for recruiting violations at that time. 
And who did Roy beat in the NCAA tournament in 2001? Kelvin Sampson, Oklahoma. I remember that game. And yeah, then Kelvin goes to IU and you know had had some success. But and look, Kelvin Sampson, where is he now? He's a head. He's a college basketball coach. You know, head coach of the college basketball program. Um, so that quote uh, about uh, the problems with coaching in college basketball it still rings true to this day. After Bob Knight left Indiana. It took him 20 years to make it back to Assembly Hall. Do you feel like that's all been repaired now, Jers? There's still some bitterness there about how that time for him ended. Uh, well, going back to uh, Dan Patrick's show, I think it was uh, there where Coach Knight when, uh, had that f- uh, now infamous saying that uh, he had hoped all the people were dead uh, that were at IU that were part of his firing, the Miles Brands and, and people like that. That really did a lot of damage. Um, but I think you're right. Uh, they brought coach Knight back, uh, with a lot of his former players. I think it helps greatly that now they have an IU alum, a former player as their coach with Woodson. I think I saw an article a couple weeks ago that coach Knight had made it out because coach Knight has his own health problems right now, but he had made it out to assembly hall to visit with uh, coach Woodson and, and the team. Um, I think, yes, that, that, fi- that issue has finally been, been put to bed. If you ask me, I think, I think the, those fences are mended. You are a great Indiana basketball historian, so I'm just going to put this question to you now. What is the legacy of Bob Knight and Royce Waltman? You know, um, I think being the ages that you and I are, Duff, where we're close to the same age, we're at school at the same time, I, did, I think the legacy is they're the old school. They are the old guard, the old school, hard-nosed basketball coaches. My Another guy I went to school with at ISU is now the girls basketball coach down at Clarksville Providence. And we had dinner the other night, and he was just talking about kids these days. You can't yell at them. You can't swear at them. Uh, you, you just, it's just a different time now. Uh, those are two coaches from the old school that did it the old way, the right way. I don't know of any recruiting violations by either Bob Knight or Royce Waltman. Um, but they were intense. Uh, they had a way of motivating uh, kids that you just don't see anymore. And I don't care how it ended for Roy Swalman. The guy is a winner. For 42 years, the last thing I thought about before I went to bed is my team. And the first thing I've thought about when I got up in the morning is my team. And that'll be hard not, not being that way. And uh, so, yeah, I, I just felt really sad. Division two national finalist taking Indiana State to the NCAA tournament for the first time in 20 years. And obviously, Coach Knight's record speaks for itself from a basketball standpoint. So you're going to look back at those guys and say, those guys were the old school. They did it a different way, but they did do it the right way. There will never be anybody quite like those two. Anybody who knows me up here in Michigan knows I love to bring up the fact that I'm from the state of Indiana. I'm a proud Hoosier, even though... I'm a Sycamore alum. I always make sure to make that distinction because anytime people see the Indiana State gear, they automatically assume that I'm Indiana University. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's Indiana State University. Winners in Indiana wear blue. (laughs) There you go. I love it. Thank you so much, my friend. Always good to talk to you. You know you're welcome on this podcast anytime. Thanks for having me, Duff. That was really fun. That's actually the second time I've had David Hooper on to talk about our time together at Indiana State University. The first time was two years ago when we did a tribute show to our late friend, Scott Reese. Scott was a fellow classmate at Indiana State University. He was also legally blind, but that didn't stop him from being a place kicker on his high school football team, and that got him national attention during those days when he was growing up in Griffith, Indiana. And Scott came on, and Duff said, to talk about those days. Three days or so after we got knocked out of the class my junior year, I asked my head coach, I said, you know, I got a far out question for you. Would you ever consider letting me kick? And he said, yeah, I'm not going to tell you no in terms of what it is that you want to do. So I went to kickers camp. Um, when the weather started warming up in between uh, the end of my junior year and the springtime, right before my senior year, I was also on the track team, wasn't very good, but I started to practice outside. You can listen to that entire episode by just going to my website, aduffsaid.com, and look for Episode 10, The Legally Blind Place Kicker.
Not long after Scott and I recorded that episode, he was murdered outside of his Indianapolis apartment. His death remains unsolved two years later. Just days before his passing, he wrote a Facebook post to David and I saying we needed to get the band back together. Now, Scott was just as excited as everyone else on campus during those years when the Sycamores were beating IU and making it to the NCAA tournament. So in a lot of ways, this episode is another tribute to Scott. When he said we needed to get the band back together, it was in reference to an Indiana State baseball game that the three of us did on radio for WISU. The broadcast was coming out of a break, and Song 2 by Blur was playing in our headsets. So the three of us started playing instruments in the air, and I was mouthing, Woo-hoo! in my mic. It really was one of those moments that you kinda had to be there to appreciate it. Up next, I open up the vault to another classic story, and I give you a glimpse into next week's episode. This is for you, Scotty Eyes. Fourth Coast Cider Works is the place to be for hard cider in Oakland County. Located in the main entrance to Canterbury Village, Fourth Coast is quality craftsmanship, quality hard cider. Stop by Fourth Coast and try some of their many flavors on tap. You can also take some home in a can or a howler. Fourth Coast is open Thursday through Sunday. For a complete list of ciders and hours, go to fourthcoastciderworks.com. The best hard cider is on the fourth coast. And that's a Duff said. Once again, I want to say thank you so much for hitting the play button on this podcast. And that includes two very special listeners, Michelle and Bethany. They recently became patrons of a Duff said. Now for as little as $2 a month or $24 a year, you can help this show to continue to grow and provide the content that you enjoy. And if you become a patron of A Duff Said, we have got a lot of great gifts in store for you. We've got bumper stickers. We've got t-shirts. Heck, I'll even record your voicemail message. So if you're having trouble ever figuring out what to say, I'll say it for you. And that's A Duff Said. If you'd like to become a patron of A Duff Said, all you got to do is go to patron.podbean.com backslash a Duff said. It is time now to open up the vault. During my conversation with David Hooper, I said this. That night, I had just experienced one of the coldest nights in my sports casting career. Here's a look at what took place that night. Winter is coming, and we got a harsh preview of it tonight here in Millington. Now, Chief Meteorologist Jamie Cagle warned us that we would need the hat and the gloves and probably a well-insulated blanket if you were going to be out in the stands tonight. But some of the Millington fans I talked to said even that wasn't enough in these brutal conditions. The objectives were simple. For the Millington Cardinal football team, win a second straight regional championship. But for everyone else, just stay warm. It's it's so cold. I feel like I'm um, stuck in an ice cube. The temperature at kickoff was a bone-chilling 15 degrees. These heaters were brought in to keep the players warm on the sidelines. It felt more like a night in January rather than November. It's pretty cold. Like... This is some intense stuff right here. Folks here at Millington were bundled up, drinking hot chocolate, and huddled together for warmth. Even the cheerleaders sported a much different look. Our coach let us wear leggings underneath our skirts, and she's actually letting us wear our winter coats, which she hates with a fiery passion. And on a night like this, there were some open spots in the bleachers. I don't see a very big student section right now. Where are you guys? They're either going to be late or they're going to be babies and not show up. (laughs) The Millington win would make it all worth it. We're going to suck it up, Buttercup. Now, as you just saw in the highlights a few moments ago, this game came down to the final play, and Millington came up just short tonight. 
The Cardinals season comes to a bitter end on a bitter cold night. It took several minutes in the car before my hands and feet warmed up after that night in Millington. But what really warmed me up was seeing the final score of that Indiana State beatdown on the Hoosiers in Assembly Hall, 90-69. to It was the most dominant performance that the Sycamores have had in all their games with the Hoosiers. And now here's a look at what's on tap for next week's show. I want folks to, re- to be able to say, I remember that guy. I got a pizza from him. Or I remember that guy. I got a picture with him. I remember that guy. I got a t-shirt from him. Hey, I remember that guy. He made balloons and made a balloon hat for my kid. Um, And if they remember me in fondness, um, mission accomplished. For more than a decade, Buddy Franz entertained Detroit Pistons fans at the Palace of Auburn Hills as the red, white, and blue Afro man. Buddy recently joined me to share his entire story as this memorable character and why he has yet to make an appearance at Little Caesars Arena. Now, if you're hearing this podcast for the very first time, be sure to check out my website, aduffsaid.com. There you will find the previous 49 episodes that I've done. This show can be heard on Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and YouTube. You can get updates on upcoming shows and other info by going to my Facebook page, sports journalist Duff Tyler. You can also find me on Twitter, at Duff Tyler. Normally, this is the part of the show where I sign off by saying, if Duff said it, it must be true. And while that is true, this time around, I'm handing off the mic to a 21-year-old me when Indiana State won the Missouri Valley Conference title back in 2000. The Sycamores get the win over the Bradley Braves and the conference championship. Thanks for listening, and this is Duff Tyler. So long, everybody.